Welcome to the Century 21 Leading Edge podcast, where our mission is to give back and provide value to the industry that has been so amazing to all of us. We do this by keeping realtors and the public up to date on what's going on in our industry, growing our collective knowledge as professionals, and most importantly, by giving realtors and brokers everywhere the tools necessary to bring their business to an unprecedented level. Welcome back, guys. This is our first podcast that we're doing live with social distancing since COVID-19. So it's, it's great to, uh, to be back together with you guys. I actually haven't, I think I've seen you once, but I haven't seen Anthony. So it's, it's great to see you guys. And uh, tonight we've got some great wines to try, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Paul Barron. I'm the broker of record, Century 21 Leading Edge. Anthony Bungaro, uh, broker and partner at Century 21 Leading Edge. And I'm Tassis Chinakakis, broker and partner at Century 21 Leading Edge. So great. So tonight, I think that what we want to do is, is I guess, just start talking a little bit about, you know, how we've handled COVID-19 with, uh, with the brokerage. And, you know, maybe Tass, you can, you sort of led a bunch of the, uh, the protocols and the, and the masks and yep. the sanitizer. So give us an overview. <laughs> the masks and the sanitizer. The sanitizer, the and gloves. And all, all the fun things that you couldn't find for, for the longest period of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that, um, you know, the, the initial learning curve of, uh, you know, what, what is the best practice and, you know, what are other people doing? Uh, so I think educating yourself first was the most important thing, and and obviously seeing what our medical professionals are are recommending, right? So so I think that that's really the approach that we took was, uh, what are those best practices, and now let's put them in place, and and of course that included stuff like obviously making sure that we have ample. Uh, hand sanitizer available, uh, which was difficult to get, but I think a lot of companies, even local companies where, where we sourced ours, uh, switched over and started doing a lot of production on that. So, so that's uh, become more readily va available. And, and I think, um, you know, stuff like screens, we, so we put up plexiglass screens in front of the reception desks to create that barrier, provided uh, masks for our, our staff. Um, and really, I think the, the biggest part has really been communicating and educating everybody uh, on, you know, what are the best practices. It seems obvious now because we've heard it so many times, but, you know, the simple thing of, you know, washing your hands for 21 seconds, uh, you know, making sure that you're social distancing, um, you know, things like that. Just getting used to simple things like not shaking hands with somebody, right? You don't shake hands. You, hello, how are you? And, and uh, I don't think anybody takes offense at that anymore. Maybe they, they did in the beginning, but uh, I think it's become the norm now. So I think we did a lot of that. And uh, I think also a big part of it was making sure that our staff felt comfortable um, coming into the office um, and, and, and having that adjustment where, you know, between realtor and staff, there, there was the adjustment of, hey, don't go behind the desk, don't do this, email, call, instead of having a, a personal conversation. Uh, and, and all of that, I think, has, has, has gone well as, as we've educated everybody on that, right? Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what we've been doing process-wise. Um, and then industry-wise, obviously, there's, there's a whole bunch of changes that have been put in place. Uh, and again, I think a lot of that was adjustments, right? Uh, almost right off the hop, um, you know, uh, brokerages um, put into place COVID policies for viewing their listings, which, which we had in place. Uh, that became, uh, you know, a bit difficult to manage as the market picked up because a lot of them were requiring signature of both realtor and sometimes uh, clients, and then having to return that to the office. Uh, that has since uh, changed because uh, ourselves, our brokers using Broker Bay, they have automated all of that. So that is fantastic. Um, and I think with that, again, I've, I've just um, you know, been very careful to advise realtors that, yes, it's become a, a normal stake in our business, but let's not ignore it. Whatever that COVID policy is, right. uh, make sure you adhere to it, right? So uh, we, we, I think, 
Our job is to make sure that the public feels comfortable. So, so all of us as realtors, as brokerages, putting these things in place ultimately uh, gives the public the confidence to start you know, going back into a normal routine of trading in real estate. So, so that's kind of, uh, I think, where, where we've been at with it, right? Yeah, and I think it's, it's obviously been critically important to also make sure that the public feels safe. Yep. Right, and and making sure that our agents, you know, know how to uh, to, to deal with that. Yep. It's kind of difficult with you way over there. Right? <laughs> I'm talking, I'm talking hello, there. Right. Hey, uh, hello. <laughs> um, so we, we we also, you know, it's interesting too. Uh, a lot of different clauses and stuff that yes. came into play. Yes. And there was a lot of controversy on that. I think there was even a, a Ram article where somebody uh, sort of lambasted Aria for foolishness in terms yeah. of the clauses that, that they, they recommended were, uh, mm-hmm. they were recommended and and i think that we had put out you know here's all the clauses uh yeah. and here's what we don't recommend yeah. and here's what we recommend using so i think that people get carried away with things sometimes yeah. and you really have to fine tune what our best practice is. And I think that we've done a good job to try to work with our agents and work with the consumers to make sure that everybody is, is protected and everybody is safe uh, and everybody is comfortable. You know, we, we also did not have all of our realtors working through this time, right? We had some people that said, hey, uh, I'm older, I'm in a higher risk group, I've got you know, certain ailments, and they may have decided to not work at all through this. Yep. And uh, we supported them and supported their decision, and, and, and all is good. Yep. So, so I think it's interesting as we've, uh, as we've come through this, uh, just the changes and the adaptation that yeah. companies have made. Yep. And, and that's probably a, a, an interesting thing to talk about, how many people are sick and tired of, of Zoom meetings, right? And, and, and WebEx <laughs> meetings and, and Facebook meetings and, and all of these different uh, ways. So it, it has actually been interesting because I think that we really can adapt our business to be more efficient. Yeah. And, you know, quite possibly, you know, there will be interactions, there will be personal interactions. We're social beings. Yeah. We do want that. But there is a lot of efficiencies for conducting things uh, that way. You know, um, as you guys know, and you couldn't help but notice with all of my campaign manager and and all of what he was posting on social media, that I I did uh, get elected as director at large again on the Toronto Real Estate Board. So thank you, uh, everybody that uh, (laughs) voted for me. And uh, thank you to my uh, campaign manager. He's (laughs) blushing over there. Good job. I uh, did a great job. And, you know, we, we started a MLS selection and we had over a hundred candidates and we did that selection process on Zoom meetings, <laughs> right? So it was four hours of Zoom meetings the other day to go through all those candidates, talk to them. And normally these things would be done yeah. in person. So it, it is really interesting how we adapt. And I think that a lot of companies will start to make changes, you know, and, you know, the, some, some are talking, you know, you look at uh, uh, Redfin down in the, in the U.S., uh, he's coming out and saying commercial real estate, office real estate is no longer needed. It's going to, you know, disappear because everybody's going to work from home. And the truth is, is that everybody's not going to work from home. Yeah. In fact... We're probably already sick and tired of working from yeah, home. Get, get, and there's a lot of people want to get that to are quite anxious uh, to be back. How about yourself, Anthony? Have you been coming into the office, or did you work from home a little bit, or what did you I, do? I, I, first of all, the safety was very important to me. So, and it still is. And it's not all about me, as you said, Paul. We want to make sure our our clients, our staff, and it was well explained uh, by by both you. But uh, generally. I came into the office because I sort of used the position that, look, the office is closed. Now, in the initial stages, we had some reception at the front desk, phones, because we wanted to operate our business accordingly. Uh, But I came in, closed the door, and that was it. 
So when I finished, closed and locked the door, that was it. So the only person that ever went into my office was myself. Uh, but uh, again, it's not all about myself. You, you hardly saw anybody. Now, more recently, you're, as things have picked up, et cetera, which is good, you're starting to see people coming in. But I think the changes in our attitude and our changes in, you know, this is kind of the way uh, that we have to behave. Um, you know, when we hear from the government and maybe in, a, in months from now and six months from now and next year, I kind of think of that. I wonder if one day, and I, and I think the answer is yes, but I wonder if one day we're going to look back and go, do you remember when we went through that? Oh, yeah. so that's kind of, you know, a wishful thing, but that's what that is going to happen. Maybe the smaller example is, remember when SARS came yeah. in? It was, wasn't that horrible? But it, it's a thing of the past. But I think the habits of people, Paul, as you said, we are social beings, but we can be social without being, you know, on top of each other. You know, being of the Italian descent, hey, how are you? And if I see a knife, give me a kiss, you beautiful lady. Mwah, mwah, thank you very much. But I don't do that. And I don't, I, I don't even anticipate in the near future ever doing that. It's not about just the other person. I've got to think for my health. So you've got to be conscientious. But no, it's, uh, it's been good, Paul. It's worked out well for, for, for myself and being very safe. Good, good. And I think that this is, you know, very different than a lot of the other uh, downturns in the market, uh, government interventions that we saw in 2017, uh, financial crisis in 2008. Mm -hmm. This has been a very, very different thing. Yeah. And, you know, uh, quoting Benjamin uh, Tall from CIBC World Markets, you know, he put out a report where he's saying, you know, it's not a recession, it's not a depression, it's a new thing yeah. with an end game. And the end game is a vaccine or a treatment. Right. And if we get those, then that's it's done. True. That's right? true. And that's the, goal. the challenge is, when and depending on who you, who you listen to, yeah. when will that happen? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that, uh, that really makes it, you know, very, very different. And when we look at the, you know, the effect of this, you know, 15, 16% unemployment, but that is temporary, yeah. and then it will come back yeah. where it'll get down to, you know, 8, 9%, when people are brought back to work, yeah. but it still will be high, but we won't be in a recession or a depression, we will be in a recovery. So we will be recovering from that. And, and it, is, it is interesting to look at all of the different uh, uh, projections from different companies, stock people, They're all, over uh, the map. all over the place in terms of what is going to happen with the market? What, what's your take, Tass? Huh. I'm looking at Anthony. What's your take, Tass? My take. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so I've read most of those projections, and I think they range anywhere from uh, an increase in prices, and I'm talking about Toronto-specific, right? Because right. Canada is a bit of a different story. Uh, anywhere from an increase to a decrease, right? So, and anywhere from, you know, an increase of five or 8% to a decrease of up to 10%, uh, 18%. 18% oh, yeah. was Canada wide, but uh, I think that that's really extreme. I think that really um, right now, what we've seen so far is it's not pointing to that way. I think it'll, it'll remain relatively steady in terms of pricing unless we have a really large uh, influx of listings, which does not seem to be the case because, uh, as you're aware, the, the Ipsos Reid uh, poll that Treb did, um, you know, I, I put a lot of weight on that because, you know, when they're asking uh, people that are likely or highly likely to buy a house, and it went from, it was, I think, and it was done in the midst of, of COVID. So April, it, it was April, done April. in April 24th, April 27th, right? Or yeah. 27th, yeah. So, so you can't say that the timing was off. So it was right in the midst of, of COVID. And they found, you know, 27%, I think, was the number that said they were uh, likely or highly likely to buy real estate in the next 12 months, compared to last year, which was 31%. So only a decline of, of 4%. Uh, but then when you looked at people that were likely or very likely 
to sell their property in the next 12 months, it was night and day. It was only 17% this year said that, compared to I think 34% said that last year. So, yeah. so think of that, yeah. half, half of the people compared to last year are saying, yes, I'm gonna sell my property. Yet the people saying, I wanna buy real estate yeah. is almost unchanged. So if that maintains, then I think the prices will maintain because right. I think we're already at a, a, at a low supply. Right? I, I would go a step further and maybe it's because my brain thinks of where I am, which is, I'm gonna call it the GTA. So because my brain is that small, I can't think of all of Canada. Yeah. But in terms of the, the uh, CMHC, uh, your national bank, various large banks are talking about this is going to be, and, and maybe that's media, media is negative. This is going to be the worst time for price drops in, in all of the other years that have taken place uh, in 2009 and so on. This is going to be the worst drop. Now, what, what I heard you say, Tassis, is, again, my theory of supply and demand in terms of what seems to be happening in our region, mm -hmm. that if there are a continual below normal amount of properties listed, if the Ipsos Reed poll is actually correct, and it seemingly could be, that there's not as many people putting their property on the market, and there are a lot of buyers out there, prices will go up. Yeah. And, and they have gone up quite, quite considerably, even in the worst of times, even in the last period of time. So I don't anticipate uh, again, it's not a Canadian statistic. Everyone's got an opinion, and no one knows, right? Because well, all I, the I know. <laughs> other than Paul, nobody knows. So I, I, I agree with you. I, I like what you said in terms of Canada. It's a different, you know, maybe total number. But in our neck of the woods, I think prices will go up. If if listings start going through the roof, then it will start to wow. It'll stabilize. Oh, they may dip down. Yeah. But I don't foresee that. Yeah. I see you them know, climbing up. Uh, it's interesting too on the on the Ipsos, uh, and I think they dropped the read. It's just an Ipsos, I, Ipsos survey now. Yeah, yeah, you're right. What's um, it called? It's Ipsos. just called Ipsos. Oh, Ipsos. I, I P S O S. Oh, okay. Ipsos. They dropped so it. So what's interesting is that the sellers, the reason that they gave for not selling, so 80% of them is because they like the home that they're in. Yeah. But 22% uh, of them said that they don't believe that the buyers will buy during COVID-19. <laughs> So that's why they're not listing. Oh, maybe there's so, a reason. So, so the, the sellers think the buyers won't be out, yeah. but the buyers are saying that they, that they will be out. Yep. So let, let's, uh, you know, let's continue to, to talk about the market and because and, and, I think that's interesting for people to uh, understand the different scenarios. So I, I did bring a little bit of information from... Uh, from CMHC and what their forecast is. And, and it's interesting because their forecast uh, was extremely negative right. and uh, didn't really make sense. It was completely different than a lot of the other surveys and, and, and projections that were out there. And then they changed their policies almost in line to try to accomplish what their prediction was. But before we, uh, before we look at, at CMHC, I think it's important to understand as well that uh, all provinces, and that's why you were saying the GTA and, and our area, uh, every, everything is not created equal. Yeah, so right. when we look at the starting point, right? So we look at uh, how many provinces do we have? Ten? Yes. Something like that. <laughs> I don't know, we'll do a British we Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan. How many? Uh, yeah, you, you should tell us how many. Steve, could you check that? How first? many provinces? Oh province and territories. Oh I think it's 10 province and yeah. territories, right? Uh, but don't tell my kids if I get it wrong. <laughs> so what, what's interesting is that you look at, for example, when we look at supply and demand. 10 provinces. Oh, wow, okay, 10 provinces, three territories, okay. So when we look at uh, each of the provinces and we look at the uh, months of inventory available yeah. uh, pre-COVID, yeah. right? We're not starting at the same point. So pre-COVID, uh, the GTA was less than two months of inventory. 
Yep. You look at Prince Edward Island, it was 10 months of inventory. Yeah. Right. And, and months of inventory is if no other properties came on the market, take there's home. enough homes available to satisfy 10 months of sales. Right. And you look at the Western provinces and they were in the six to eight month range. Yep. Right. So yeah. the, the idea is that we're in a completely different starting point. That's and right. then when we look at during uh, COVID, the inventory didn't change. Right. It, it was still just you know, a little bit higher at about two months. So the idea is that you need to have these two sales and inventory drastically drift apart in order to see an increase in, in, in prices or a decrease in prices. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, the whole thing is not sorted out yet, right? right? So the effects of people going back to work, uh, listen, if you lost your job and you own a home and you didn't get your job back, yeah, there, there's going to be some fallout. So there will be some lost properties. There will be some people selling because they can't afford it. And for the most part, they may be selling to move down into something less expensive. They may be selling and going into, into rental. And, you know, obviously if that happens, that could affect the supply. The inventory. But, but the challenge in, in the GTA is that there's always been so much pent up demand. Yeah. Yeah. And when we look at moving into the start of 2020, January and February were helter skelter. Yep. We were just going crazy. There was a huge undersupply. There's a huge amount of pent up demand. Massive increases on prices. Yeah. Yeah. Massive so, amount of, uh, of multiple offers. Yeah. yeah. So, so it was crazy. So uh, let, let's, uh, let's introduce our, our wines. Oh, yes. And uh, I'm actually going to just uh, get tasked to introduce the first one because he's, uh, he's been drinking that and cradling okay. that. And we're going to get him to tell us a little bit about that wine. But what I did tonight, which is a little bit different with us getting back together, is my drinking habits... Right, so I was I was saying to you guys that I took nine cases of empties back to the LCBO or back to the beer store where you take them uh, through through this COVID uh, challenge. But what I tend to do is I, I start drinking a wine or I'll taste a wine, and then I will go to my cellar and I will pull the next the next the same wine. <laughs> so uh, the first one that we're trying is a Chianti Classico from 2006, and I had two cases of this. This is the second last bottle that's left in the cellar because I go to a wine, I like it, you go and then I look at what we're having for dinner and I think, oh, I'm going to go for another one of those. So, Tass, let me uh, uh, give us your impression of that. Oh, I love uh, it, actually. Uh, you love I, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> I would say it's very earthy. It's got a strong nose. Um, yeah, and just tastes great. <laughs> there you go, Anthony. What what are your what are your thoughts on that one? I like I like my wine connoisseurs. Yeah, they did the nose and and let, let's have your uh, the Italian stallions uh, view of the Italian wine. This would go good with a nice pasta yes. or bolognese, bolognese sauce. Yeah, and um, it's hearty. It's 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 a hearty yeah. wine. Yeah, it's not delicate. It's I, I don't want to use the wrong language. Because, but it's not light. No. no, It's no. not like light. There's some red wines, it's just like you're sipping water. This one has depth. depth. How's that? Substance, yep, yes. absolutely. Uh, I, I think it's a, an, an amazing wine. I've been uh, pulling it quite regularly. And uh, uh, obviously the Chianti is, is the Sangiovese grape. And... Um, you speak, a good, I, I you speak that, it the good uh, of the Italian. I said that properly, but uh, something like that. Uh, I used to say Sauvignese, and somebody corrected me and said, no, it's San Giovese. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't speak of the Italian, but That's a uh, all good. Uh, but yeah, excellent wine. And, um, uh, you know, I've been uh, pulling it on a regular basis. The next one that we're going to try uh, is... And, and these are three completely different wines tonight. So the next one is a 2007 uh, Chateau Neuf de Pop. And I think it's a Cuvée Exceptionnel. Tass, can you see that bottle? Is that what it says on there? I'm pretty sure that's what I brought. Because I've been... Uh, is it the middle one? 
Uh, no, the one closest to you. Oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, I've, been, I've been drinking a lot of Chateau Neuf with my steaks and stuff like that. And, you know, we, we a lot of times try wines that are similar. These are not at all similar. Mm -hmm. They're completely different uh, grapes. This is from the Rhone Valley. And it is a uh, Syrah is the main grape in this uh, in this wine. So uh, we'll, we'll get a we'll get a taste of that one in a, in a few minutes. But I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the CMHC report and and what they uh, they said. And then certainly, Tass, we want to get our mortgage people's uh, sort of reaction to that. Yeah. So I, I I think that. Uh, the interesting uh, part about it is that uh, CMHC is is predicting a, a nine to eighteen percent drop over the next uh, twelve months, right? For Canada. For Canada, and again, when you look at uh, Canada, you need to look at differentiating the markets and obviously more inventory in other markets. And there's depressed Maybe. provinces, Calgary yeah. with the oil. Yeah. They, they were already, you know, so, so you mentioned Paul earlier, yeah. uh, at the beginning of the year, we were, we were riding high. Well, Calgary was already sliding down, right? So, so this is just kind of added to that, right? So, so that's kind of an unfair brush to paint all the provinces across, across Canada, I think, right? Mm -hmm. but anyways. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. No, but you bring up oh, a valid please point. Please interrupt. It's all good. No, th th then I'll, I'll make it very brief. You bring up a very good point because whether it's your next door neighbor, your friend, uh, a colleague, you bump into somebody and they say, oh, I hear things are really bad. It's going to go down to 15 or 18 percent. It is a, a Canadian brush, but the first thing that comes to my mind is where are they getting that from? Because yeah. again, I'm thinking about what's busy. happening in Prices your life. Are going up. Yeah. There was multiple offers last night. What, 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 really, why are people saying that? So unfortunately, or whatever, statistically, this is a Canadian number, which you have to deal with. It's CMHC. Right. And, and but people don't you decipher it sometimes. Sure. Heavily. And, and it is also a, a number that is very different than the majority of other predictions that are out there. So it is a very negative prediction, True. right? And you know, we look at uh, buying real estate, and, and we do a lot of lead gen at Century Twenty One Leading Edge, and we're doing a weekly um, webinar on is it the right time to buy. Mm. So we we did that webinar in April, and we were talking to people about should I buy now, and. We, we know that in, uh, in, in March, uh, February and March, the prices had peaked and they had gone up from December, January from 838 average price to 920 average right. price. And then they went down slightly in April to about, about 830, again, about yeah. the, the same as what they were prior to that. And everybody was saying, well, they're not gonna buy because it's going down. It's going down. Yeah. And then when we look at <laughs> when we look at the May numbers, they and I'll give you the exact numbers, but off the top of my head, May it went from 830 up to 870. Yeah. Right. Right. So what they're thinking was was not the case. That's right. right. So so it, it went up. And were you better to buy in April or May? You were better to buy in April. Yeah. That was the the low time. Now the other thing that's interesting is that. You know, a lot of times when people ask agents, is it a good time to buy? Oh, yeah, right? That was but the, the time. truth is, is that that is not the right answer. Well, we right? say that all the time. I know that we do, but we shouldn't say that yeah. because uh, it depends. Yeah. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you, to sell are, them if you are looking for a home to live in yeah. and we look at the market as a whole and we look at, okay, if you bought in 2000 and uh, no, if you bought in 1996, right? The average price in 1996 was 225,000. And now the average price is 860, 870. So long term, it, it's a yeah. long term game. So yeah. long term, the idea is that it goes up like this, right? But so you can't up. necessarily pick the peaks and valleys, but on the long term, it's a good investment. If you're buying to flip, 
then you got to take a little bit more care. But yeah. if you're buying long term, if you need a place to live, uh, then makes, now might be the time. It makes sense, yeah. right? So, so when we look at the the CMHC uh, uh, changes to their rules. Um, I'll give you those changes. So uh, they were looking for a lower change. Number one is a lower percentage of uh, of debt as a percentage of gross income. So normally uh, buyers were allowed to have 39% of their gross income uh, in order to qualify. And uh, what they've done is they've moved that down to 35% or their total debt service, they were allowed to go to 44%, and now they've reduced that to 42%. And then the second change is the minimum credit score. So your uh, credit score, you used to have to have a minimum credit score of 600, and they've now changed that to where they want one of the two borrowers to have a minimum credit score of 680. So they've increased the standard. And then uh, the third thing is that they uh, are no, no longer allowing borrowed funds for down payment. So the old rule, you could go with an unsecured loan, you could get uh, credit card uh, money, uh, and now uh, CMHC is saying that it has to be from your own sources or a gift from a parent that is not repayable, right? I think that uh, some of the kids had that put in the in the policies that it was not <laughs> repayable on that on that loan from the from the family but uh Tass, just talk about um you know what our in-house uh, mortgage clc was saying yep. about you know cmhc and who determines which insurer yep. and 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 also the fact that this applies to insurable loans so this is Correct. when you have less than a 20 percent down payment Correct. So just talk Correct. about what uh, what's happening. So I that. think uh, obviously when this announcement uh, was was made, there was there was some some panic from from realtors saying, "Oh my God, it's going to be more difficult to qualify for CMHC." Uh, so I had a conversation with uh, Shuba at Capital Lending Centers, and and you know they're they're always on top of all of this stuff. They already put out an email to to all of our realtors as well, explaining it. But what was most interesting was. He said, really, it has absolutely no bearing on the customer because he says, it's not like a cu the customer picks, oh, I want my mortgage to be insured with Genworth or CMHC, or, there's three in total. They enter a deal into their, their, their software that basically analyzes and determines which of the insurers that mortgage is going to go to, which does it fit the best. For instance, uh, the example he used was, um, you know, one might have where your mortgage and improvements, you know, your improvement portion of your loan can't be more than $50,000, whereas CMHC said was it was up to 10% of, of the value. So if it was eight, 800000 you could have an $80,000 portion for renovations, right? So that's part of the, the parameters that the system kind of, uh, mates the mortgage with the insurer. Uh, but the other two insurers have not made these changes and have, have stated that they're not making the changes. Right. Uh, and really, we, we have to understand why did CMHC do this? And, and the ultimate reason there is they want to reduce the amount of uh, insurance business they have in single residential properties and increase the amount of uh, mortgage insurance that they have on multi-res properties. So it is really just a shift of where they're insuring. Their, so so this, they put these to basically uh, almost force the system to give more business to the other two insurers, right? In terms of the, the single residential, right? That, so, so it's as simple as that. It, it really ultimately isn't going to affect the regular borrower who thinks, oh, okay, the rules have changed. Yes, they've changed for CMHC, but not for the other two, right? right? So, so really it is um, much more flash <laughs> than, than, than really uh, effect on anybody, right? And, and uh, you know, Shuba had the same complaint that we do, that, that you said earlier, Anthony, right? He said, you know, the, the, the CP24 version was 
oh my God, you're not going to be able to qualify for a mortgage, right? That, that, that's really what, what the, the flashpoint was. But he says anybody in the business that understands this and once they've read it, no difference. there's like, this really doesn't well, make any is, difference. This is why people need to tune into our podcast. hundred <laughs> percent. So that they can uh, understand that it's really not going to. Yeah. So, so really it, it is a non-factor is, right. is what he's saying, right? So, and, and the other two insurers uh, have, have ample room to, to increase their portfolio. So right. it's, not, it's not like that, that business is going to uh, cap out and there's not going to be room for more. There, there's ample space there. Yeah, I mean, it's oftentimes that uh, rules and policy changes come into play and people paint a picture yep. that is, is not, a, not an accurate uh, yep. picture. Yep. Right? Oh, even just recently, COVID numbers, right? So uh, you, it, it'll be very common to see a headline of, uh, you know, sales down. And then they'll, they'll, they'll quote this huge number, right? Treb reports sales down 50%. But so, so that's what your, your common uh, reader picks up. Yeah. So they're picking up thinking, oh my God, prices are down 50%. Well, no, number of units sold was down 50%. But price was up, right? But you know that's not how oftentimes people, people read, read the headline. So so that's a scary thought, right? But uh, uh, you're right. We're we're here to educate everybody. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. And uh, how are you finding the agents' reaction to these things, Anthony? Have anybody uh, coming in with concerns? Uh, not a factor. Not not a lot of factor. We the, the the CMHC thing did cause confusion for the agents, and you clarified that, and, and we want to continue to clarify that. Um, I think the agents are sharing with me that there's a lot of mind, like this whole COVID thing. Uh, people's thoughts, processes have changed. For example. There, look at the elderly in, in the retirement home. So there's been a lot of people thinking, I'm not having mom or mom and dad in a retirement home. We got to get them in a house. Oh, our house is too small. Let's buy another house. So, you know, I'm hoping this we is one. We can help them with that. What's that? We can help them with that. We can help them with that yeah. and we can list their house and sell them house. Also, you're getting, uh, <laughs> maybe there's a joking side and I shouldn't joke with it, but people that were husband and wives, maybe, uh, splitting up <laughs> because they were together so long that maybe there's going to be that. So they're going to have to sell. But there's a lot there's of either going to be COVID babies or, <laughs> yeah, exactly. or COVID divorces. They're both sides. Right? There you go. But also the mentality like, you know, people are, are, are missing the opportunity of travel. And so I've been discussing with, you know, fellow, fellow realtors in the north where cottage country, recreational property sales are really yeah, and it could be weather orientated because every time the weather gets nice, but you're hearing that people are looking at, look, why not buy a cottage? Why not get a recreational property? We can't travel, let's put our money there. So there are some shifts in mentality, but from my real estate brain, this will allow potential buyers, listers, sellers. Right. This is what I'm starting to see yeah. and starting to hear. Yeah. And people are spending money, Anthony. I had a friend who uh, we were talking, he had uh, gone up to his cottage to put his jet skis in the water. And when he, he was picking them up from storage, he commented to the guy saying, oh, wow, you don't, you know, you don't have much in here. And his response was, good luck if you want to buy a jet ski. He says, yeah. my entire inventory is completely sold out. Yeah. So he says, you have a double whammy. There was increased demand because like what you said, yeah. honey, we're not going on vacation. So the money that we were going to spend on that, let's buy a jet ski instead, right? right? Right. And then you also have the decrease of supply, right? So a lot of the supply chains have been slowed down. Yes. So he, he commented, he was sold out for the season. He says, I cannot sell you a jet ski if I wanted to. Oh, yeah. And that, that's interesting, right? So there's a lot of shift, a yeah. lot of shift going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So just to, uh, I always like to give you the numbers, right? So just to give you the, the TREB numbers, uh, we had in, uh, in, uh, in May, we had the uh, number of transactions was down 53% uh, from May of 2019. Yep. And the number of new listings was down 53.1%. 
number of sales was 53.7. So it's interesting that the supply and the demand are decreasing at yep. exactly the same rate or almost exactly the same rate. Yep. What's also interesting is that uh, the board was down 53%, but Center 21 Leading Edge was only down 42% yep. in our number of sales. So we obviously beat the market uh, because we've got, you know, some systems in place to allow people to continue to work. And, you know, it's interesting when we talk about setting up the offices and stuff like that, uh, there's lots of companies that completely close down everything. Uh, of our nine main locations, we maintain three open throughout the entire pandemic. And now we're back to, I think we have eight of nine that are now back open and, you know, limited hours, limited staff, a lot of precautions in place, but uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, doing that. And the other thing that's interesting to look at is, and uh, you can go back and fact check my, my numbers because I gave you them off the top of my head. So May 2019, the uh, average price was 838 and May 2020, the average price is 863. And if we look at the, that 863, the average price in April was 821. So it went down from uh, from 902 in March, and and was at a high of 910 in April or in uh, in February. February, right? So so it's interesting that everybody said, "Well, I'm not going to go buy because the prices are going down." And when we look at where we are in the market, uh, it may go down, right? It may go down if there's a number of people that you know are losing their house or have to downsize and we get more listings, but it's unlikely. It may go up in June. Because we have a supply problem in the GTA. And, and the other thing that's interesting with, with that supply problem is that even if prices go down, he, here's what happens in the, in the GTA. That if prices go down, then the investors come out of the woodwork. And they'll buy up the inventory and prevent it from going down further. So there is no way I, I will go on uh, a limb. I will put uh, my reputation on the line that says that there's no way that we'll be in this nine to eighteen percent uh, reduction Impressive. in the GTA. You know, we may see fluctuations, but when we look at that uh, fluctuation in April, that was down from February high but the same as it was in uh, in january and december of, of 20 uh 2019 it's a big number so and it uh, was no doubtedly the worst month of real estate ever <laughs> right in terms of activity like right. things were completely shut down and, and as paul said uh, you know we we remained open there were a, a lot of real estate offices and a lot of realtors that literally just said that's it you know i'm, I'm in the basement leave me alone right yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I'm, I'm even going to give you guys, uh, you know, the most up-to-date information. And this is from our, our uh, software analytics that we use at Century 21 Leading Edge. And, you know, we're a company of 800 plus agents uh, doing a lot of, of transactions. So this is the numbers for the 23rd week of the year which is, uh, I guess, to June 6th. So this is last week's numbers. And last week's numbers, we had 1,433 appointments booked for the week, which is up 35.7% from the week before. We had a total of new listings for the week of 128, which was up 42.22% wow. from the week, week before. before. Wow. So the listings are, are going and we had for the week, we had a total of our listings sold of 53, which is up 12.7% from the week before. Good. So we continue to have these numbers continue to grow and we, are, uh, we, we had reduced our staff uh, by about 50% and we're almost back to bringing the majority of that staff back uh, to deal to with, the, uh, with the demand. 
So, yeah. So, uh, you know, if, if you are looking at buying in the GTA and you believe that you're going to wait for this special time, right, uh, you know, two, two things happen. One is uh, the special time may not come, <laughs> right? So that's one challenge. The other challenge is, is that we also need to look at the affordability aspect. And I know that we have a 1.99% five-year mortgage rate, right? I know we're covering all the questions that we've got in, Steve, <laughs> with, uh, with what while we're talking here, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 check, we'll check and see if there's any additional hey, questions left. when we run out of steam. But you know we, we seldom do, right? But we'll, we will check for that. So the idea is that you can get a 2% five-year mortgage rate and you're paying 870,000 for the average home. If that home goes down to 800 and the mortgage rate is 4%, <laughs> it costs you more, yep. right. right? So when we look at real estate, we yeah. have the purchase price, which really is, is not as relevant as the amount of down payment you need for that purchase price. Correct. And then the financing. real thing is the financing, the is financing. the carrying cost, That's is right. the monthly investment, as we like to call it. Oh, the monthly right? investment. And the truth is, is that when rates are low, when there's not as many people competing for the properties, and there is less people competing for the properties today than there was in January and February. Right. But it's starting to catch up. Right. To where it was before. So there is opportunity now. And if the prices decline, the investors are out. Uh, so I, I think it's a win win situation. It, it's just, just buy real estate in the GTA, Anthony. I, I said that it's never just as simple as that, but maybe it is. <laughs> maybe it is as simple as that. Yep. So what else do we need to talk about tonight, guys? Let's talk about that second wine. Anthony, oh, did you yes. try the second wine? I was waiting for the opportunity. Yes, so uh, this is, uh, as you guys know, my favorite region, uh, the Chateau Neuf de Pape. And, French? Uh, uh, it is French from the Rhone Valley of, of France. And uh, give that a taste. And tell Much me what smoother than the first one. What's that? Not, not as strong as the first one. No, nowhere near as strong as the first one, okay. I found, anyways. Yeah. Anthony, what do you think? Smoother, no? I don't know if I'm using the right, see, the, see. the right words, but uh, I never have lighter, right smoother. I don't know if, if that's okay. the right term. but Notice okay. the, this is French, so notice <laughs> the bouquet. <laughs> so you guys know that it, it is a completely different wine. So yeah. they have no, no, a lot of times we compare but it is similar well, they wine. They I, it's softer, not yeah. as heavy, not as bolognese. Yes, yes. <laughs> they taste very different. They do. I think that it's flavorful. That, it's yeah. that that I would I would describe that Chateau Neuf as far more fruity, more mm -hmm. fruit forward. Yeah. Than than the uh, than the than first the Chianti, one, right? Yeah. Um, Why did you look at me when you said that? Fruity, <laughs> <laughs> fruit forward. Um, so uh, yeah, just an excellent wine, yeah, and and really uh, a Chateau Neuf is usually. Uh, what fairly, would that go? What type of food? Fair, uh, with a, with a nice steak, yeah, is 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 ideal, but it's also interesting that a, a Chateau Neuf is uh, usually this is a fourteen and a half percent alcohol, right? But you don't even taste the alcohol in that. I don't no. anyway, right? So a lot of times Chateau Neufs you'll get up into the into the uh, uh, fifteen and a half percent, whereas the uh, the Chianti is a is a thirteen and a half percent alcohol. But that is uh, very uh, uh, rose petal uh, and, and lots of lots of fruit forward in that yeah. wine. So so very nice. Uh, Steve, what did you think of that uh, Chateau Neuf? Did you like the second one? Was the Chateau Neuf? Yeah, no, the Chateau Neuf was uh, was delicious, but the first one uh, to me was just just incredible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There you That's go. The Italian. I'm, I'm, I'm generally a big fan of your uh, Chateau Neuf to uh, the Pops, but That's yeah, your Italian know, blood. Chateau Neuf is a, is a big one in the, the Baron Cellar because we've, mm -hmm. we've yes, had it is plenty a big of one. that. And, and I, 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 okay, so, so just to be, just to be, uh, to be fair, uh, Chateau Neuf is my favorite region, but if you looked at 
do I have more Brunellos and Chiantis Italian. than Chateauneuf? And a Brunello is just a different region in, in, uh, in Italy that is made from the same Sangiovese grape, right? Uh, and I actually have more Italian wine in my cellar than I do Chateauneuf. That's a great. Right? And it is actually closer to the door. <laughs> and it is a, a go-to yeah. uh, go to wine. So I, I drink all kinds of that. So you're not hurting my feelings if you, if you like that, uh, that better. And usually a, a Brunello is usually a higher end in the, in the Sangiovese grape Right, but this one is a, is a Chianti Classico. I think it might be a Reserva, but uh, yeah, it's a Chianti Classico Reserva. What's Reserva mean? Yeah, it's just their their top of the line. They're 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 better grapes. Better, right? yeah. they, they they took out the stems. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't include. They that. didn't mix the grapes with their yeah. feet. Yeah. So 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 normally a Brunello is a higher end in that wine, but this is this is a uh, a Chianti that I think is, stands up to a Brunello, right? So it, it, is, it is a higher end on that. And, you know, I, I think they're both great wines. They just taste very, very different. Very different, yeah, exactly. Very different. Totally. Yeah, yeah, this is excellent yeah. as well, but just yeah. like you said, very different. Yeah, for sure. So let's, uh, Steve, maybe look at, uh, do we have anything else that we wanted to cover tonight? Uh, or do we want to look at some questions from the... Paul just guaranteed the market's going up. Uh, <laughs> and now's the time to buy. <laughs> now's the time to buy. So let's each, let's each take a stab at that. Uh, so let's look at month, month, quarter, 2020. Month? Month, quarter, so in the month of June, that's yeah. the month we're in, right? Yep. So what's going to happen in June? Right. Uh, what's going to happen uh, by September? And what's going to happen by December? Anthony. Oh, my goodness gracious. Tell us. Um, from what I could see in terms of June, I think the numbers will be stronger. They've, they've equally gone up each and every month, so you'll see strong amount of sales. And I'll, in, in terms of the GTA, prices will continue to rise. Uh, I'd say by September, um, the only factor that would change that is uh, if the listing inventory does peak up to a higher amount, then you'll see more stability. You won't see increases in prices. So that to me is the main factor. If inventory stays ridiculously low, then you might even see a little bit of a spike in prices. But I think sales activity should be consistent uh, right, right throughout. I, you know, There's gonna be no record amount of sales, but you'll see consistent every single month. Um, the end of the year, or what was the last to say? Yeah, to, to, to the end of, of, of 2020. Yeah, to the end of 2020, you'll just see it stabilize. You won't, uh, you won't see a record amount of sales because sales are going to be down, but it just depends on inventory for prices. I think you'll see stability. And uh, from an agent's brain, keep getting the listings. Mr. Janikakis? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm of the same uh, thoughts. I think short term, the prices will likely go up. Yeah. Um, I think that um, uh, in, a in the next quarter, they, they will likely level off, um, assuming that we don't have a massive increase of inventory. Uh, and I think from there, they'll just kind of level off. Because I think in the next quarter, will probably be a, a big de a determining factor of um, How pe it's gonna end. Pe people that... <laughs> are possibly not gonna go back to work, we'll know in the next three months, right? So I think that after that, so, so I think we could see a little spike of, of uh, inventory if, if there is some fallout there, uh, but then after that clears up and gets absorbed, I think it'll just level off. That's right, right. that's what I think. 
and I think we'll start off very strong next spring, for okay. sure. I'm okay. very confident of that. Very confident. Whoa. Maybe someone disagrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess uh, the heat uh, yeah, causes the hot lightning. And the cold. So uh, now, what's really going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we save the we save the best to last. No. So obviously, you have an I, opinion. I, I have a, an opinion, a yeah. prediction, uh, but yeah, I don't have a, a crystal ball, or it's 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 faded. <laughs> so, a couple of things that that I think are going to. Uh, be a factor. So I think that we have to differentiate the uh, freehold product to the condo product. And here's why. The biggest factor that drives the new construction and the condo sales is uh, investors. And investors are supplying the rental market with product because there is not a lot of purpose-built houses anymore and with immigration challenges we will see this decrease in immigration and we have not Canada has not changed their immigration policies but because of COVID-19 I don't think that we're bringing in the same numbers of potential immigrants and immigrants are the ones that are usually renting products and that's why the investors are out uh, going after those products so so I think that that factor uh, will show a little bit of a softening in the high-rise product and I think that we could see you know a little you know four six percent decrease in the new construction condo product because of those factors right and, um, uh, you know, offsetting that is the fact that uh, in the condo market, a lot of the builders are not releasing their products. So if they don't release their products, yeah. then we also then have an undersupply, <laughs> yep. right? So that may offset it Factor. a little bit. But it's also interesting is that when you look at the new construction side of things, where we have on the resale side, we have a two month of inventory in the GTA for uh, resale. In the new construction side of things, we have about a six month supply. That is our normal supply, right? So it is considerably higher than, uh, than, than we have uh, with, with the resale market. So I believe that in June, uh, I, I predicted uh, 45 to 5,000 transactions in uh, May. We had 4,606, I think. And I'm predicting 6,500 transactions in June. And that is down from the 10,000 that is normally going to happen in June, right? So it is still off, but it is continuing to, to go up, yeah. right? You know, it's also interesting when you look at CMHC and their rules and people's interpretation of that yep. and the fact that those changes take place July 1st, that there may be people out in June thinking that <laughs> to they get have the to product buy. before those changes, which really don't matter because they'll just go to GE or Genworth, right, yep. to, to get the insurance. So, so I think that that will have a factor um, on them. And then I, I believe that we will see the fallout from the lost jobs, right? And I think that if we didn't have the fallout from the lost jobs, I see the market continuing to go up right. on, the, on, the, on the resale uh, side and the freehold side. But because we are gonna have that come into play, so depending on how big Badly that is, is bad that is. should level that off. Yeah. So. I, I'm predicting by the end of the year that we have an average price of 950 in the GTA. Okay, there's my, uh, prediction. my prediction. And um, I, I think that if we have a greater number of people that don't get back to work, then, then that will keep that softer. But uh, I believe that it is a market that is going up. And if you are in the market to buy, uh, you're better to buy now than, than, in, then. than in November because you'll pay less 
and we know we know what we know. We know that the current mortgage rate is low, <laughs> uh, which helps for the affordability. That's true. Uh, so 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 that's the time to to buy. Well okay, said. so we're recording this so we can go back and <laughs> check to see uh, if we're uh, right. We record these things, right, Steve? <laughs> Oh, you forgot you you you, you, you oh, press yeah. you, you press record, the, right? You forgot to plug it in. <laughs> <laughs> what other questions do we have? Um, what are you currently doing to ensure safety of agents at the uh, at the office? And I'll preface it with this question came in two weeks ago, and I believe you guys opened up some or all of the offices today. Is that is that correct? Yeah, we've been opening them as we go, but I'll, I'll let I'll let Tass. Um, just give the high points on that uh, That again. Yeah, I think just educating the agents on um, uh, what our procedures are, the social distancing, providing sanitizer everywhere, uh, providing barriers oh, for you. the reception. Um, also, we've limited uh, the amount of people that can use rooms, uh, Steve. So uh, actually, that's just changed as of today, but prior to today, um, so for instance, our boardrooms were limited to five people uh, because you shouldn't have more than five people. You can't social distance. And, and we had some adjustments there depending on the size of the rooms, right? So a, a lot of educating, a lot of uh, informing people, uh, proper hygiene and, and, and all of that. And obviously all the other things, having uh, staff wear masks. Uh, and, and we've actually put out uh, a Century 21 leading edge preventing COVID-19 policy. And, and that was actually, uh, I should have mentioned that first, because that is something that we uh, formulated after consulting uh, with, with RHR and, and best practices in the medical industry. Or, and, and then we put that policy forward to everybody, right? Uh, our entire company got that. And they did a, uh, th there was another question that kind of is in the same vein. The first one was, at the at the office and then the next question is what is your best practices for showing houses open houses basically more of a client safety perspective so open houses there aren't any <laughs> that, that one's easy uh live there aren't any live so yes we, we do have a virtual open house there's virtual yeah. open houses and, and i think there the the first uh thing is is you know basically also what our governing bodies have been suggesting. So the first course of action is, uh, where, wherever possible, show a property virtually, right? So, so we've had multiple seminars on, on uh, educating our realtors uh, how these 3D tours work and the fact that you can virtually go on virtual showings where you're actually walking through the property with your client virtual and your client can direct it, you can direct it. So, so I think part of it, uh, was just educating uh, our realtors. That technology already existed. What, what this has done is it's accelerated it, right? And, and there's a huge amount of people utilizing it. So I would say that's first choice, Steve. Uh, if you are going to physically uh, view a property, then you wanna take uh, precautions, right? Uh, you know, you wanna have a mask, you wanna sanitize, and all of these are part of the COVID uh, procedures that all of the brokers have in place as well when you're getting uh, showing instructions. Uh, commonly it is sanitize your hands uh, prior to entering the property, have a mask on, don't touch anything. Most listings are saying we're going to leave all the lights on, all the doors open, don't touch anything. As you leave, sanitize your hands again, right? So, so I, I think that those are kind of the general rules and obviously you know practicing social distancing right uh, I had one agent say the first thing I say to my clients is put your hands in your pockets and leave them in there as we're walking through the property you know that, that's brilliant right it's the smartest thing to, to tell them so that's it that's great. Um, and then uh, the last question that we, uh, that, that we had is uh, directed towards the CMHC changes and asking specifically how you feel those will impact the uh, impact the market, which they added will already seems like it will be strained over the next uh, over the next year. So I think you've addressed a few of those, but if you want to address that specifically, yeah, I, I think I think that you know it's interesting that 
we have two things that take place, right? We have perception, right? And then reality. So in reality, it, will, it, it has no effect on the market yeah. because there's two other insurance companies uh, to, to get your financing uh, insured with. So it will have no effect. Now, will it create an effect because of what people's view of it is? Their perception right? of it. Their perception of it. And, and I think that there could be. I think that we could have a brisker June because people are looking at that July 1st deadline as something that changes something. So, you know, uh, the, the, the reality is, and, and, and just going back, Steve, to the, the uh, Ipsos survey that was done, right? So in the Ipsos survey, 63% of the people surveyed said that because of COVID-19, the government should do more to help people be able to buy real estate. Their suggestions were eliminate land transfer tax, yeah. right? Uh, eliminate the provincial and the, and the city of Toronto land transfer tax. Uh, uh, eliminate property taxes uh, for people. So, so the consumer's view is that they should do more. Because they then, all want to buy real estate. Because <laughs> they want to buy real estate. And, and CMHC is, is taking these positions and then the stress test is, is, is preventing the ease of ownership. And I believe that we don't really need these things to come off because the market in the GTA is already helter-skelter. It's helter-skelter uh, with, the, with the lower amount of volume and lower amount of transactions that are happening. It is now uh, three to four offers instead of six to eight offers, right? So it's still a seller's market. It's still difficult to find real estate. Yeah in the GTA. So that being said, we don't need those things, those incentives in the GTA. But those incentives are requested on the country as a whole. And you know, some, some things that are brought into play like the uh, foreign buyer tax, which was specific to Toronto or maybe Golden Horseshoe and then to Vancouver. Right. So those are policies that were brought in locally to uh, to to limit that increase in, in in sales. But again, that was a perception. So when that happened, perception, yeah, people said, well, we shouldn't buy because prices are going to go down. Right. And they did for for a couple of months and they went back up again. <laughs> Right. Because the truth is, is that there's only, you know, four percent of the buyers were these foreign buyers. So it really didn't have that effect on the market. But the perception of it uh, had a bigger effect. Yeah. And when once people realize that the perception is a false perception, then they're, they're back to their normal, uh, their normal state of things. Right. So. That's, uh, that's my view on that. That's a long-winded answer on that. I thought, I thought it was a great, uh, great there you answer. Go. There I, you I, go. I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure people will appreciate it as well. Right. And the last question that we had that I actually thought was an interesting one was a uh, question specifically about mindset <clears throat> from somebody <clears throat> essentially saying that they, they flip-flop from feelings of, of helplessness, trying to motivate themselves through it, um, what mindset are you trying to adapt during the current si situation? And when you falter on that, what are you doing to maintain uh, that, that course? Who wants to take that one? Anthony, are you our mindset man? It's a very deep question. <laughs> very deep. Because it's easy to say you should have a positive mindset. It's like if somebody's down and out and you, you, and you say, and you wouldn't say this to them, but don't be stupid. Why are you down and out? You should be positive. You see, that, that isn't the right thing to say. Um, if, if you've lost your job and you can't make your payments and, and you're down and out, you should have a positive mindset. You know, you almost sound like a, a bubblehead. But the truth is, in real estate, um, nothing gives you a better mindset when you get a listing and there's six offers on it. And the best time to sell is when you just sold your last property. And, and these, these are all <laughs> old sayings, but these are facts. 
So the problem is, is that you can't just say to someone, have a positive mindset. It's, it's a natural behavior. So um, I don't know if that's the answer you want or what people want to hear, but it's like, you know, as an individual, do you look at the glass half full or half empty? When you get out of bed in the morning, are you starting off on a positive foot or a negative foot? These are things that, you know, you are what you think about. These are all the things that we've learned from page one, chapter one. So how you think is how you are. Um, but I'm not being insensitive uh, to people that are having some horrible hardships. You know, how could you be insensitive to someone if in their family they died because of COVID and, and have been very ill? Oh, don't worry about it. Just have a positive mindset. So it depends what uh, frame of reference and what you're experiencing. But all I can say is be positive, have your goals. And uh, there are a lot of agents, and you mentioned TAS, even it was so horrible uh, after the 15th or 17th of March that they just buried themselves in the basement and said, this is crazy. I got to be safe. I don't want to see anybody. But there are some agents that have done just as many sales or more and are having their best year, you know. So that sure helps <laughs> for your mindset. So that's, that's uh, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm talking too much like you. You make more sense when you talk, but I, I spoke from my heart. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, that, I think that that's excellent. I think to add to that, Anthony, yeah, I yeah. think, uh, Steve, we were very quick to jump on uh, technology yeah. and and remaining uh, in touch and communicating with all of our realtors, which I think in this situation specifically was uber important because isolation is I think what leads to that that you know negative mindset right. So if, if down if you're in your home office like mine that is two feet by two feet and you don't leave there, well, guess what? It's pretty easy to, to get down. And then you think the entire world be, just becomes that room, right? That like there's box. nothing else happening. So I think that we've been communicating, uh, you know, A, we, we provided a ton of stuff for, for realtors to keep themselves busy and keep the, get themselves educated. We, we're doing more education now than we ever, ever have uh, as a company, right? Uh, so. <laughs> Every day we have stuff going on. Uh, to add to that, uh, Century 21 Canada uh, was, was having a, a great program that they were putting on every day at one o'clock. So notifying our realtors that, hey guys, participate in this. Because it wasn't all you know, sales stuff. A lot of it was, like Anthony said, mindset, right? How do I maintain a, a mindset? You know, I, I discussed in some of my videos just, you know, physically how, how to, you know, stop eating the junk food because that's just going to make you feel even worse, right? What to do physically, what to do mentally, right? So giving people pointers on that. But really, I think communication, and I find it that once you give people that, that, that even that glimmer of hope and you share some stories, then I, I get, this is typical questions or, or typical conversations that I've had recently as like two weeks ago. Oh my God, Tas, I don't know what's going on. Out of the blue, my six buyers that all said, I'm not gonna buy this year, three of them found houses last week and I did three deals. Right. So this is someone that was, you know, isolated, was getting a little bit trickle of, of the positive from, from us and the stories. So then you hear that story and you think, well, hold on a second. If that guy did three deals last week, what the hell am I doing locked up in the basement still? I, 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 should, I can do deals as well, right? And we have had plenty of realtors, like Anthony said, uh, that are having a record year in the midst of this, right? So I think educating the rest of our realtors that, hey, uh, you can work through this safely and, and still be productive, uh, always safely, that, that being the key part there. Uh, I think that, that you, know, you get that glimmer of hope, so then you know, that I think goes a long way in, the, in the, the mental aspect of it, right? The mindset. Well said. So I, I just will add that uh, I think that the right wine. <laughs> yeah, is, I was going to say, you know, nine cases of, well of empties. This is what adds to the right mindset. So on the floor, Anthony. Yes. Uh, this is the last wine that I've been having as one of my go-to wines. And, and this one, I have to actually look at the bottle. It's a, it's, a, it's a Bordeaux wine. So that's France as well. And this is from uh, Pauillac. And it's a 2001 uh, Haute Bag Liberal, and um, 
it's it's prim primarily a Cabernet Sauvignon grape, and uh, very very different. All three oh, completely different. They're all and, different. And this is uh, this is a wine that would uh, go really nicely, like the Chateau Neuf, with a with a steak. Yeah. Um, you know, because it's it, it's got some good age to it. What, yeah. what are your guys' thoughts yeah. on this one? Very tanny. I don't know if that's the the right word, but very similar to the first one. You guys are going to have to start going to, to wine one of these uh, yeah, things that gives learn. you the uh, verbiage for uh, Yes, for we don't know the tasting. verbiage. I need you to... Is there... Okay, let me <laughs> ask you a question. When you drink this, do you have a lot of flavors in your, in your mouth? I do. Okay. I, I think that this one's a little bit more tannic. That was the than, word than, I'm than looking the other one. And, and tannic is that lip, lip smacking That's what I mean. There was something uh, that went in my there, mouth. Right? Yeah. And... To me, uh, this one is not nearly as fruity as the Chateau Neuf. The second one. But yeah. it is yeah. uh, uh, more earthy. Yes. And um, just, uh, in my view, just an excellent, uh, an excellent wine. No doubt, but I did. And your words are good. I noticed that on my, on my tongue. <laughs> there you go. Stop, stop and, laughing from the cheap seats. And then other than the wine on the mindset, <laughs> I, I think Tass is right, is that you know, when we face challenges, right, which this is this has been uh, the Scary. ultimate challenge for the world. Yeah. What we need to do is we need to band together. We need to uh, support each other. And, and I think that that's what all of these social programs and training and things have done is that they've brought us together, maybe closer together. Yeah without being together yep. uh, in order to, uh, to learn from each other, uh, to learn new things. And to look uh, forward. And to look forward and to strengthen things. And uh, I've also heard, that, heard the stories, and even, even a month ago, uh, I was talking to an agent you know, that was saying to me, yeah, you know, I only had five showings on this new listing that I got. But I got three offers. <laughs> right? So who the heck cares, right? And, and the idea is that that is, is case in point of the idea of the virtual showing and looking online. Yeah. So the majority of people are doing that. And who is out in a pandemic to buy a house? Someone who seriously it, wants to buy. Exactly. <laughs> so it's not, it's not the person that <laughs> they, they have to buy. They looking have at to, decorating they ideas. No, they have to right? buy. They want they're, to buy. They're somebody that's serious. Yeah. So, so I think that there's a huge amount of value in that. And I think that our brand has done an excellent job with our 21-minute uh, workout, uh, what we're doing with that, and, and constantly bringing things to the table uh, to help people uh, with their mindset, with their, um, you know, with their, with their training, with their education, right? And, and teaching them new and, and exciting things. So I think that that's a, a good way to end tonight's session, uh, sipping on this Bordeaux. Uh, did we have any other questions, Steve, or that's, uh, that's it? Are, are we, have we, have we covered 15 minutes? Are we good to wrap? We're good. Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoyed uh, doing this in person again, and Likewise. we will continue to maintain our social distancing. So cheers, cheers. Mr. Bungaro, Mr. Janikakis. Cheers, gentlemen. Mr. Kirk. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks very much, guys. Paul Barron signing off from our 17th podcast. Anthony Bungaro, partner at Century 21 Leading Edge. Tassis Janikakis, thank you for joining us, and have a great day. Take care, guys. Cheers.